What's the divorce rate now? 60%? 50 or 60. Okay, that's if you're married. <laughs> so what must the failure rate be for just a relationship? 99.9%? .9 yeah, that would mean you'd have to date roughly a thousand mm. people to meet someone you're gonna stay with. Well, it's all very encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> Something's up. There's something in the air. <laughs> What's with you? I think this is it. What's it? I saw Sienna again. Sienna? Yeah, he's dating a crayon. <laughs> <laughs> Discuss toilet paper. Toilet paper? Yeah. I told her how toilet paper hasn't changed in my lifetime and probably wouldn't change for the next 50,000 years. And she was fascinated, fascinated. <laughs> Talking about yeah. toilet papers change. Yeah. Softer, softer. More sheets per roll. Sheets? Comes in a wide variety of colors. Colors? Oh, okay, fine, fine. <laughs> it's changed. It's not really the point. The journey of someone coming in the room with an idea for something, and then saying, "Yeah, that sounds good. Let's let's do that," and then the it going into an outline form, and then a script form, and then uh, a read-through, and then a rewrite, and then a rehearsal, and then more rewrite, more rehearsal, and then a shoot night, and then an editing process, and then finally going on the air, is essentially an off-road egg race where you carry the egg in a spoon. And <laughs> it's, it's broken terrain, and it's hills and it's ruts and that's that's the race to see and you have to run because you've only got the four days to shoot it and the editing is just as maddening and, and hectic as the writing was as the rehearsal was as the shoot night was as every process along the way there's never a chance to go hmm what do you think perhaps we could do something a little more tender you know that, that you don't have any of those moments. It's, it's literally running with an egg on a spoon. I would go through my day, now all of a sudden I'm programmed to now only think in terms of this show. So um, I started to write down uh, whatever thoughts and ideas I had into a little notebook. I remember Larry having a book, uh, a notebook with this funny thing, this funny thing, this funny thing, this funny thing, and saying, okay, I can take from page 12 and this and that. And it looks, it becomes of a piece. And I think a lot of the ideas actually predated the show. Um, and the show is just a vehicle for, him to, for those ideas to get out of the notebook. What made a successful episode was um, how funny the idea was. <laughs> it's just these things from your life that were just so funny that you could get, you could see three scenes in it right away. We would come in the first day of a new season and hopefully come in with a list of uh, ideas that would be two or three sentences max and they could tell immediately like yes that's an episode. They knew they, they were talking to odd guys you know Larry and I were odd guys so they wouldn't come in they you know I mean they would come in and pitch and obviously some things would hit and some things would miss but they never thought this is too crazy for these guys nobody would think that because clearly, we were capable of just about anything. Is it? Could it? Could, could he have? It is! Poppy peed on my sofa! Save the whale! Oh, you gotta do it! Save the whale, George. For me. get a Christmas card. <laughs> Everybody else got one. Jerry got one. Kramer got one. I thought we were good friends. I don't get a Christmas card. I don't get it. You want a Christmas card? You want a Christmas card? All right, here. Here's your Christmas card. There was a tone we set with the writing staff that Larry set, that it had to be original, it had to be unique, it, it, it had to be something very funny and very fresh. Pitching stuff to Larry was always an experience because he had a little pen which he would have in his hand and he would sort of roll it and then he would just, you'd be pitching and he would sort of look at you and just shake his head. 
Like this, like this was, like literally and you were speaking the gibberish, not even good gibberish, not even interesting gibberish. We had this thing where Jerry was dating this very exotic uh, uh, South American woman who worked at the UN. Right. And she kept saying, you know, and he could never, he, he could never spend time there because he was like, oh, there's a big mess on the floor of the UN, I have to run over there. And it turned out she was the cleaning lady <laughs> at the UN. And we, we tried so hard to sell him on this journey. Well, he never right. wanted to do it. No, I just don't. I just think you're going to see it coming. What else you got? We pitched one thing to him, and I remember he just sort of turned and kind of just walked away. <laughs> and he never said yes or no. He just kind of went. I think the no was implied. Yeah. I remember somebody coming in and pitching me an idea at one time. And, uh, and I'm saying, no, no, I don't think so. And, 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 and the writer said to me, but we've done this so many times before. And I went. That is not a point in its favor. <laughs> there would be times when you would go in and you'd like have a bunch of ideas and you'd pitch them and they didn't really go for them. But then you would just tell some, something that actually happened to you or an anecdote. Like we talked about a guy we knew at college who ate his uh, Snickers bar <laughs> with a knife and fork. And Larry said, oh, you should put that in the show. It was best to get the two of them together because every once and again, Larry David would say, I like that. And after a week of work, Jerry, for the first time, would hear an idea saying, haven't we done a variation of that? And inevitably, Larry might say, yeah, I guess you're right. Forget that. Larry and I just had that great cross filter. If both of us kind of related to it in some way, it, it seemed to work. The greatest feeling was when you're pitching to Larry that every once in a while, Larry would put his finger up and go, or, or, and then you would just sort of sit back because a lot of times just getting him invested in the idea and as soon as he hooked into it, then he could see where it was going before you could a lot of times. We couldn't wait to like pitch some stuff and yeah. we'd be stuck the first day like, well, maybe if we tell Larry this, he'll make it funnier. And he always did. You needed Larry to finally approve all four stories. Then the trick is, once you've gotten those stories approved, is turning those four stories, which are really just the germs of stories, into a script. <laughs> They would try and get going on a script, so you know we knew we could. We had five or six going at one time. Everyone was in their own little rooms, and it was like a whole bunch of people doing a whole bunch of individual studies. And everyone would sort of wander around. It was like a hospital for comedy stories. And how's your patient doing? How's your patient doing? How's your patient doing? And you'd sort of talk about. I don't know. I've I've got a first act, but I think the second act is dead. And if you could deliver a a pretty good first draft, you know they were happy. And then from the first draft, Larry and Jerry would, would go in and work on it. Larry and Jerry shut the door for like three days when they decide they're going to do an episode, and they sort of do their rewrite of it. They would sit in the room, and they would act it out and read it. I knew that Larry and, and, and Jerry were behind every script that was written. Larry and Jerry working together and really working out the script took place behind closed doors. We weren't privy to that. But every so often, you'd get a buzz on the phone, and it would be OK to come in and get more pages. and. I'd, I'd say probably one of my just biggest internal thrills of, of typing the first draft or the, the rewrites of Seinfeld was when something would just catch me funny and cause me to laugh out loud. And Larry and Jerry would just bolt out of their room because they wanted to know exactly what would make the writer's assistants laugh. Usually we would film two shows in a row and then get a week off. The first week we would film on Tuesday night. The Tuesday schedule was great for our show from a rewriting point of view um, because you really can use your weekend effectively. Then we'd have Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday to write a show, cast a show, and get set started in order to film the following Wednesday. They would run down the entire episode scene by scene I would find out what was required, how many people were in the sets, if there were entrances and exits. Sometimes we had 15 or 20 sets. Some of them were just one wall or two wall sets. But nevertheless, they had to be pulled together. I would go away, design the set, go up and knock on Jerry and Larry's door to show them what was going on. They were relatively interested, but they were more interested in the writing. And they just looked at it and said, yeah, I think that's going to work. We were all about writing. We didn't really want to hear from anybody, talk to anybody. It was just writing and, and, and rehearsing. The casting was quick, editing was quick. Everything else we did very quickly, but we labored over the writing. Characters were always inserted into the show for whatever fit comedically. So it's not like, I want to put Jerry's parents into the show. Let's get some parents and then come up with an idea for the parents. First, first the idea comes, and then you cast from the idea.
And when I look back on some of the guest stars, you know, that jumped to starring in their own TV series, it's remarkable. The Courtney Cox, she played in the episode called The Wife. The Virgin, who was played by Jane Leaves. Terry Hatcher, she was in The Implant. Jamie Gertz, she was in an episode called The Stall. We had Michael Chiklis, David James Elliott, Brian Cranston, who played Watley the Dentist, Peter Krause from The Limo, Six Feet Under. We saw these people and saw their potential, so that was hugely exciting, those casting sessions. The typical casting session would happen either the same day that we got the script or the next morning. I was the sixth one in, and uh, I was sitting near the door where I heard all the women before me screaming like banshees. The actors would sign in, they'd have about 15 minutes with the material, and then they have to go into the room and perform. The first sight and sound I heard relaxed me, and that sight and sound was Jerry sitting at his desk. We read through it, and he started laughing, and that's the indicator. You know, if you can make him laugh, then you've got a good shot of being on the show. I knew that from having watched the show that they respond to, you know, something different, quirkiness, choices. Usually, it's the people who, who make us laugh the most. Larry came out and said, um, yeah, Danny, you got the part. Can you work in uh, 30 minutes? And I said, yeah, absolutely. When someone walked in that had that funny thing about them, you know, it was like, okay, let's just get him and we'll, and we'll make it work. You go from not having a job to knowing you're on the number one show in, you know, such a short amount of time. It's just such an exciting feeling. Well, table readings for sitcoms are just the greatest experience because everybody's excited about a brand new episode. The writers are there. There's anticipation. The, the new cast is in. The supporting cast is there. Uh, and, it, and it's just a way to start anew. I sit down and we all start going around in the read. You could see everybody was in character almost immediately because of the words. And then you, you knew it was only going to get better as the days went by. That was just a cool thing to already see the creative process going just from being at the table read. They were very loose and easy and nobody stopped anybody. It was just everybody laughed like hell. What uh, is that? I painted my face. <laughs> you painted your face? Yeah. Why? Well, you know, support the team. <laughs> walk around like that. Why not? Because it's insane. Uh, oh, hey, you gotta let them know that you're out there. It's the playoffs. <laughs> uh, seldom did something get to the table that was not funny. Um, and if it wasn't exactly what it needed to be, it would be exactly what it needed to be by shoot night. It, it was a show that got better as you went, not worse. I started to get very comfortable knowing that whatever problems we had at that table read, if the script was weak, it got fixed. Now, to me, Seinfeld is Seinfeld because of those scripts. They got the, the scripts got the ball, you know, to 10 feet of the goal, and then we would run it into the end zone. When we first get to the floor with the scripts in our hands and start blocking, uh, we knew our characters so well that we could walk and find our place in Jerry's apartment or whatever set we're into quite quickly. Let's move on to the set, and the four of us will kick it around. Well, you know, this line might actually be funnier on a lane because it would be more unexpected, and vice versa. And sometimes we would also say, you know, if, if Mike did one of his, his things here, you know, we'd get a laugh that we're not getting. So we were looking for opportunities for each other and taking care of each other. When Tom Sharonis left us and Andy Ackerman came in uh, to replace him as director, I, of course, was a little concerned uh, about something new in the middle of it, you know, don't fix what isn't broken. He had to fit in well with the cast. He had to fit in well with Larry. Andy was so seamless in, the, in his ability to blend in with everybody, let everybody kind of do what they wanted to do, and but just gently always steer everything in a, in a good direction. A lot of times we uh, didn't have the sets ready, so we would just rough it out. Sometimes we'd um, put uh, tape on the floor to, uh, to figure out what the sets might be like, and we'd do some staging and blocking accordingly. Jerry's apartment was a small set, and there weren't a lot of options. 
You know, I mean, you came in and you come in through the front door and there was what we call the alley of power. And then, you know, you could be there and do your business. You could stand at the counter and sort of use it as a podium in a sense. So it's like, this is the area for big information. That's what the alley of power seemed like to me. I was so fascinated to sit in the bleachers and watch the four of them work. Well, let's try this, let's try that. There was also an energy thing. Jason has a very crisp energy. It's very dense, it's very uh, explosive. Michael has a lot of energy too, but it's very different. And then Julia's energy and mine, they're all kind of different highs and lows, but they really balanced off very well. They could really pull a lot of humor out of places that none of us saw. We would have a run through two days in, really, just to let the writers see what we're doing. And we were always surprised that first run through what they had done with the, uh, with the script. Larry would come down and take a look and see what needed help. We didn't really get very many notes, unless the scene was completely going the wrong way. And uh, he and Jerry would go back and do another pass. Sometimes after uh, a run through, I would see Larry run back to his office. He would run, you know, to, to do the rewrites. And then Jerry would come back and uh, they would, you know, work into the night and, and, and rewrite every script. The hardest part was to rehearse all day and then write after that. Revisions would start coming in, the different colored pages. And so the script every day got altered. If you were trying something in rehearsal and it wasn't in the script, uh, Larry would have to approve it. You'd, you'd want Larry to think it was funny to keep it in. When the notes were being given, the heads were kind of focused on him. He was solely focused on making a funny show. So that was what he saw and zeroed in on all week. And if things got in the way, he would bat them away ferociously. He would come in right on you and just say, here's, here's the line. No, no, try it just a little differently. It'd be right in on you. And you realize the intensity. He, he just saw it in his head. He would stand there and watch something and go, that's funny, that's good, that's funny, that's good, that's funny, that's good. OK, wait, that's not funny. Take Wait, delay yourself three seconds. All right, try it. Okay, now it's funny. You know, and, and then let's move on. Okay, let's go to, you know. And he would just, da, 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 da. he would, it, it was like a machine, actually. Jerry had to concentrate on what he was doing, you know. But Jerry's eye also was there. I mean, Jerry wouldn't miss a thing. Between Jerry and him, back and forth, back and forth, they had the same, they had one sense of humor that was parallel, and it was very interesting. It felt like sort of the uh, inmates running the asylum to a certain extent. I mean, um, you know, there was always this feeling like, can we get away with this? The network pretty much stayed out of it. They let Larry and Jerry do the show they wanted to do. Later on in the life of, uh, of uh, the Seinfeld series, uh, we never really uh, had uh, advertiser issues or, or real content issues. The show's audience was so supportive of the material that I think it was, uh, that was the reason. We sort of worked the censors the way a, uh, a, a, the way a coach works the referee, in, in that we'd make a big stink about stuff to, to get them to give in on, on other things that we really wanted. So, um, you know, eventually it was, it's like, uh, and I'm having these erotic conversations with censors on, on the telephone. I'm, I'm going, I, I want, I need the five breasts. And, well, I can't give you five breasts. I can only give you, you three breasts. You know, well, how, what about the penis as well? I could give you one penis, you know. And so, we're, you know, and, and I'm beginning to have like sexual fantasies now about the censor who I'm conversing with every week about this kind of material. Just one little problem. Sexual? Yeah. <laughs> well, I've never really felt confident in uh, one particular aspect. Below the equator? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody does. Up until Seinfeld came around, you had many shows with 10 or 12 scenes, basic sets, a couple of swing sets. Even to this day, a lot of shows do that. But at the time, when, when Seinfeld started cranking out uh, 30 scenes and 20 swing sets and the massive amounts of exterior shooting that went on and stunts, uh, it, it really was cutting edge. Very frequently, we would read it and decide to make it a block and shoot show. We're no longer a four camera operation. We're now a single camera film shoot. 
and we would abandon the audience. The template for Seinfeld was short, quick scenes. Very few scenes lasted more than three, two, three pages. Um, so t scenes were constantly changing. In the same episode, we'd be shooting New York Street. We'd be shooting scenes in New York with the second unit. We'd be shooting off lot. We'd be shooting on two or three stages on the lot. We did a lot of blue screen where with a lot of digital effects of car driving scenes and we did trucks and planes and all kinds of different blue screen scenes. That takes a lot of work to set up six different scenes that are not on stage, plus do a stage show in front of an audience. It's a production issue that the average fan wasn't aware of, but I think they appreciated. It gave the show a vitality and a, uh, an expansiveness. When it was your script, uh, you got to go on the floor with Larry. You got to sit in the editing room with Larry. You got to go to the sound mix with Larry. It was just an extra pair of eyes to catch continuity things as somebody who knew the story pretty well. Because also, you know, if one of our shows was being produced that week, that, w that was really all we had to do. Jerry and Larry also had the next show and the show they were editing in their heads. So we got experience that most sitcom writers on most sitcoms don't get at all. For the actors on this show, it was, it was a very easy job. It was, I, horrendous to be a writer on the show, but for an actor, it was, it was great. Uh, we, we worked eight months out of the year. Uh, we would have two weeks on, one week off. We had major holidays off. Whenever we would go in on a Wednesday and the script didn't work and we were let go, it was like, uh, oh my God, I, I get to go home and see my boys. So I always saw my kids. I was home at night. I had weekends. I had the same vacations with them. It was, uh, it was, it was actually great. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, playing the part of Kramer, please welcome Michael Richards! My very favorite part of doing the show was that every week before the show would start, Jerry would warm up the audience. Hi, how are you? Great. Now, let's just talk about the name Bobbit. Just the name. Just before the, the warm up guy would announce the, the cast and we'd come running out and say hi to everybody. Um, we, we somehow formed this thing that we called the, the circle of power. Oh yes, the circle of power. The circle of power was <clears throat> when the cast would get together before every show. It was the four of us behind Jerry's bathroom door um, and we just kind of huddle up. We'd put our hands on top of each other and go, mm, yeah! Like that. Yeah! It was a ritual. We never didn't do it. Um, I don't know what it meant. I don't know if or how it helped. There was a superstition about it. Just made us feel like uh, like an ensemble. The true force of an ensemble about ready to unleash the story for that week. A lot of times doing stuff in front of an audience, you would just get amazing performances. When the lights came on, they just pushed it up to the Mount Everest. Michael especially Michael responded to the audience. the audience. He absorbed it. The Seinfeld taping is definitely has a different pace to it than other sitcoms I've worked on. We would manage to have about a third of the show left when we would bring in the audience on a Wednesday night. More times than not, we would pre-shoot without an audience probably outside on Monday and Tuesday, and then we'd have the audience on Wednesdays. And usually what we would call our, our walk and talks, where the guys um, would be walking down New York Street having a dialogue, we would perform that. Literally, the guys would walk in front of the audience back and forth on stage and reenact the scene that way or when they're in a car driving. We would just set up a couple folding chairs and the actors would have at it. And then we would play back scenes that were filmed if, if the editor was able to cut them in time. To get a real true audience reaction. All that pre-shooting, a lot of times, um, because there was an audience present, there was no room left for laughs. They would often miss a joke that's underneath a laugh. That, that is... In, uh, profoundly irritating. But it was frustrating um, hearing these tremendous laughs we were getting but not being able to use them on, on air. We would pretty much do two takes of each thing, maybe a pickup, and then move on because there was so many scenes to shoot 
that it was just like boom, boom, boom. And changes are, are continuous right up until shooting. Even when you're taping, they're still making changes. One of the other things that you have to get used to is working on the show and there's an audience of 400 people there and there's a joke and it doesn't work and you walk onto the stage, you walk onto the coffee shop set and you talk to Jerry and Michael or Jason and you sort of have a minute, maybe less, to come up with a new joke. Then you turn around and you realize there's 400 people watching you work like that and then you go back and you sit in front of the monitor and you hope that this one works. It was constant listening and seeing if things were right and changing them all the time. They got that audience in, they shot the show, and then they got the audience out. And it was a really fast-paced, fast-moving show, just the way the show plays on TV. We would always go back to the office at the end of each shoot night. Drink brandy, smoke cigars, pat yourself on the back. Larry had, had a big board, a bulletin board, that listed every episode. And then there would be a ceremonial crossing out of the episode on the board. So at the beginning of the season, you know, there's like 22 episodes, and it's a long way. They say, oh my god, we have 21 more episodes after the first one. You know, each one of these uh, seasons was such an arduous journey, and you felt like, well, you're a little closer to, to getting through it. We would always, after the shows, go to Jerry's Deli, which is uh, down the street from the studio. Jerry's Deli on Ventura Boulevard had to go there, had to get the egg cream. We would drink and eat. And it was very celebratory. There was a, the same table. It was a round table out in front. And ultimately, that table was named after us. There was a plaque put up at that table. Jason and I always went, and Jerry and Larry, and um, a lot of the writers, most of the writers, would come. And we would usually trash each other and the guests of the week and, you know, rehash funny little moments. The main thing was everybody going around the table talking about what was their biggest regret of that episode. Everything was kind of dark, you know. And it was really the only socializing we did. Uh, Michael sometimes came and he sometimes didn't. I never went to those. I was too tired and wanted to get my beauty rest. They'd be sitting up at night, you know. I know there was a circle there, but everybody knew that if I wasn't there, that was part of the circle. We developed a ritual of ordering from the menu as if we were upping the ante at a poker game. Everybody was like, I'll see your turkey pastrami and raise you um, you know, lox, eggs, and onions. The order had to sound good. The, the criteria was it had to sound good when you say it. It had to make the rest of the table go, whoa. Didn't see that on the menu. People would be ordering just indigestible stuff, considering we were starting at 1, one or 1.30 in the morning. I do remember Jason ordering the Reuben a lot of times and walking out real slow. That, that, that Reuben would put a hurting on him. And I ate this thing. And I remember driving home <laughs> and racing Jerry. He's in a Porsche and I'm in a Toyota. Racing Jerry, and as we were going over the hill, I could feel my heart giving out. <laughs> it just it couldn't move this sludge through. And I said, this stupid ritual is going to actually kill me. And then a lot of times, Larry Charles and I would uh, risk our lives on Laurel Canyon afterwards. I don't know why. I would give him a head start. I always had uh, my Porsche, and I knew Laurel Canyon. I knew every pebble on Laurel Canyon <laughs> because I would go over it back and forth and back and forth every day, every day, every day. And I was quite expert at driving it at an insane rate of speed. And he had a Saab, and, which is a good car, but it was, wasn't as fast as the Porsche. And I would give him like a three-minute head start. And then... I would drive, I would risk the entire series, my whole life. For what reason, I don't know. And he would see those taillights coming behind him. And I would catch him by Sunset Boulevard from Ventura to Sunset. And uh, I would run him down like a madman. <laughs> and for some reason, uh, that was a, a way that I guess I got some of the uh, Got, got some of the energy out of that week. And poor Larry, you know, I would say, go ahead, drive as fast as you can, but I'm going to catch you. We would shoot these shows, and the guiding principle was shoot everything, because you never know what's going to be really juicy and good. And then, you know, the stuff that doesn't work will take out. Then we wind up having to take out, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine minutes of material in any given episode. That's pretty tough to edit that much time out of, out of a show. Um, 
And usually I would think, oh, I'm just going to call NBC and see if I can get some extra time. But, he, you know, you never could. They don't have any time to give. I was in every room, from the writing room to the stage to the editing room to the rewrite, and I knew what the original intent always was. And we always used to joke, I mean, you would really kill yourself twice. You would, you would just batter yourself to come up with all of this material to build a 29-minute show, and then you'd sit in the editing room going, God, how are we going to cut all of this good stuff down to 22 and a half minutes? So you just had to get the shows down to time or make it an hour show. But usually you can, you, you know, if you work hard enough, you could do it. The show lived and died by the stories because in the end, when you're cutting from 29 minutes to 22 and a half minutes, you're cutting a lot of the jokes anyway. The editing process can be a very painful process for an actor and a writer too. Um, and so that was always a bit of an ouch. I can't recall though a specific instance where I really felt like we had compromised an episode. I mean, we were trying obviously not to do that, but I mean, there is so many, there's so much good stuff that hit the floor. I used to say that each season was a uh, transatlantic submarine voyage, that you would load up the sub with all the supplies, you know, you, we would do pre-production, we would come up with outlines and story ideas and get as much stuff as we could uh, in advance. But once that we shoved off and we were out into the ocean, uh, you just, you quickly went through your supplies about a third of the way and then you were just started eating each other to get through the season. There's always part of you that's thinking, what am I doing? You know, for, for the money, you could go do any other show that, and be home with your kids at seven at night. And I was working a number of times, you know, I'd be in my same clothes after working all night, sitting at my desk wondering, like, is this worth it? And, and ultimately, you know, you keep coming back to the same thing. Yes, it's worth it. There were times I was, I was completely overwhelmed, but there, you know, working with Larry and Jerry, you don't have the ability to say, <laughs> that's it. You basically just keep going. You, if they're doing it, you're doing it. Each time you got over each hurdle, when you get the, the idea from the a writer saying, do you have about this, to it being in the script, and it reads funny, and then you take it to the read-through, and that's, that's a hurdle, and then it's funny at the read-through, and then you put it up on stage, and it's funny, and, and you know, things, would fall out at any one of these points all, all the time. and It was always heartbreaking. You could get it all the way to the edit, and it, and, and, and it falls apart. You got it all that way, and right before it's in the, just as it goes in the show, you go, that's not the right angle, and it's not funny at all now. And even though you had it all that way, and, and then just at the last moment, you just, oh, you drop the egg, splat. <laughs>